All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is debugging Android devices in the field. Uh, I wanted to start off and say that there's going to be uh, lots of helpful links and things uh, throughout the slideshow. So I've uh, included a quick URL and QR code that can take you to the actual presentation, and you can access all the links there. So give a few seconds to anyone that wants to get a quick picture of that or scan the QR code. Cool. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Hayes. Uh, I am, uh, I've been working at uh, Memfault most recently. And for the past nine years, uh, I worked at Square uh, on basically everything Android. Uh, I started out in just generic app development, uh, working on their point of sale apps, uh, doing UI tests, feature development, things of that nature. Uh, and then quickly went into working more so on their build systems, uh, where I optimized their uh, Gradle builds and uh, also worked on uh, transitioning from Buck to Bazel. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last three and a half, four years of my time there, I worked on their hardened uh, Android operating system, which uh, they called Squid, which is Square Android. Uh, and now uh, I am working for Memfault as one of their Android solutions engineers, uh, working on their SDK and helping customers uh, integrate and add new features uh, to their uh, device observability. Um, Memfault is a global company. Uh, we have offices in San Francisco, Boston, and Berlin. Uh, myself, I actually live in Colorado and work full-time remote there. So today we're going to do a diagnostic overview of uh, the latest tools in AOSP. And we're going to go through basically three different areas. We're going to look at uh, logging infrastructure within uh, Android. Uh, then the diagnostic tools um, available to augment and uh, make it easier to understand what's going on with those devices. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about how you can uh, remotely observe uh, your devices in the field. So to get started, uh, we're just going to start with the basics and talk about log, uh, Logcat and uh, the NK message. Uh, so Logcat is a very straightforward uh, logging infrastructure. Uh, it's mainly aimed at the Android runtime uh, and has uh, five different buffers that you can access for the uh, main system, crash, radio, and event logs. Uh, if you've done Android app development, you're probably very familiar with Logcat already. It's one of the, the, one of the first things you basically learn. Uh, if you're just getting into AOSP development, uh, then you have access also to uh, the kernel logs, uh, which are found at slash proc uh, slash k message device. And uh, you can also use dmessage to uh, actually read those, uh, those logs at the command line of the Android device that you have. dmessage provides uh, a lot of colored output and filtering options to really make it easier to understand what's happening with the device. So a lot of people are familiar with uh, Jake Warden's PIDCAT uh, tool for colorizing uh, Android logcat logs, but I found with working for, uh, on AOSP, uh, LNAV to be a much better tool to use. So LNAV is a generic uh, log navigator uh, binary that, ah, excuse me, uh, that you can use on the CLI. It supports uh, log interpolation. So you can actually combine both the uh, log cat logs and the kernel logs into a single view and see uh, what's happening with the system as a whole and have the timestamps uh, interleaved with each other so you don't have to keep jumping back and forth between kernel and uh, log hat logs. Uh, when I was working at Square, we actually had 
a product that was two discrete Android devices, so that meant that there were actually four sets of logs. And so what I ended up doing there was I added, uh, or I wrote a script to prepend uh, the different device IDs to each log line, and then was able to not only see the log head kernel logs from a specific device, but from both devices interleaved with each other uh, to see how they were communicating back and forth. This made it super uh, easy to understand uh, when there were uh, network communication errors between the two devices um, or understanding state that was being relayed from one device to the other. Um, it also supports syntax highlighting and uh, custom regex highlighting. So if you have some sort of specific message that you're looking for, uh, if you're debugging uh, some issue maybe in, in the runtime, uh, you can easily create a regex to look for that. And then when you're scrolling through the logs, it'll be uh, nice and highlighted. Uh, and then finally, it does uh, also do uh, pretty print uh, of structured data for you. Now, one thing I want to mention is that out of the box, it actually does not support Android log catalogs. Uh, but at the uh, base of the slide, you'll see that there's a link uh, to my uh, GitHub repo where I've provided a uh, custom Android log cat uh, schema that you can install uh, to LNAV to make it work correctly. So next we're gonna talk about uh, the different types of crash data that you can uh, get from a device. So tombstones um, are basically uh, very detailed crash reports that you have access to. Uh, they're generally logged to slash data slash tombstone uh, and they will give you all of the uh, stack traces, uh, a memory map, open files, etc of the, uh, the application that crashed. Uh, next we have kernel panics. So uh, a fatal exception happening in the Linux kernel. Um, if you're already familiar with uh, Linux, then this is pretty straightforward to you. Uh, you can, it often uh, leaves a tombstone file. Uh, so you can use that information to understand uh, what caused that actual kernel panic. Now, uh, there's also kernel and RAM oopses. Uh, they're generally serious uh, exceptions, but they're not uh, always fatal. If they do uh, end up being fatal, uh, they're usually uh, followed by a, a kernel panic. So you, you get uh, both sets of information in that case. Now, further up into the Android runtime, uh, you have ANRs uh, or application not responding. This is any time that your application blocks the main thread. And uh, the reason that this is important is because if you're blocking the main thread, the Android runtime is unable to actually uh, accept user input and therefore your user believes that your device is frozen and not responding. Uh, so generally this is because you're doing either network or file IO on that main thread and all that work should be moved to a background thread. Uh, next, we have uh, WTFs or what terrible failures according to the AOSP documentation, but I think we all really know what they stand for. Uh, these are used for situations where something really shouldn't be possible and we'll uh, show in the log cat the WTF verbosity level. They can be fatal. They don't necessarily, they're not always though. Um, there are several instances where AOSP has put WTFs into their, uh, their code bases and they can be ignored at times or they can be actually indicative of a, a real problem. Uh, Java exceptions, again, pretty straightforward. You'll get a stack trace of uh, the exception uh, and you can basically step through each of the, uh, the different frames of that stack to understand what was happening. Uh, finally, uh, there are SE Linux policy violations. Uh, SE Linux uh, defines the permissions to uh, processes, applications, files, and other resources. And it's one of the mechanisms that Android uses to create a secure runtime environment. 
environment. So uh, in user debug and uh, engineering builds of AOSP, uh, SD Linux is generally set to permissive, so it will only log the denial, uh, but it'll still allow usage of that resource. Uh, then when you're in a user build, it's defaulted to being um, enforced at which case uh, that can trigger a crash if your application is not expecting uh, that denial. Uh, so it, it's generally a good idea to actually keep track of those uh, denials when you're doing your development phase and uh, address them when you see them. So from there, uh, we have uh, different ways of getting that information from the device. Uh, so first is uh, the Android debug bridge. Uh, this allows you to connect to your device over USB or the network and uh, run commands, pull logs, install apps, reboot the device, and push and pull files. Uh, there's a lot more than it can do, but those are generally the most common things that you can use it for. Um, and it's just a, a very powerful tool with interacting with the device. Uh, next, we have bug reports. These are generally huge dumps of information. Uh, bug reports uh, trigger dump sys, uh, which iterates through every single running service on the device and uh, calls its uh, dump sys handler, or the, the dump handler, excuse me, uh, and will give you a wealth of information for every service running. Uh, it can be from uh, network usage uh, to the state of the, uh, the Wi-Fi cellular chips, uh, any custom state within your services. It, it really has everything in it. Um, the caveat here is uh, since it is grabbing so much information, uh, it's very taxing on the system and can cause the device to appear frozen uh, or just very unresponsive in general. So it's not something that you want to be triggering on a regular cadence uh, and really should be saved for uh, when you have a device in front of you and uh, you're trying to understand uh, everything that's going on. Uh, there are usually other ways to also have a user uh, trigger it uh, uh, from like the settings application of your device if, if you're using more stock Android. Um, or there's uh, callbacks that if you're writing your own uh, settings applications and things like that, that you can use to trigger that bug report. Um, and then next is uh, Dropbox Manager. Uh, this is basically the API that you can use to grab a lot of the uh, different types of crash reports we just talked about. Uh, and uh, allows you to retrieve those those files and uh, either like store them to maybe uh, external disk or uh, maybe send them to a remote backend. So as we transition more into the diagnostics, um, one of the next things that we have is battery stats and battery historian. Uh, battery stats collects very detailed information uh, about uh, anything that is drawing power on the device and uh, will log things like wake locks, uh, file IO, network usage, uh, Bluetooth state, Wi-Fi state, cellular, all of those different things that can be very taxing uh, to the battery and pulling a lot of uh, power. Uh, and then Battery Historian um, is a web app uh, that Google provides uh, that you can run locally on your laptop. Uh, and it consumes a bug report and gives you extremely uh, detailed graphs and timelines uh, of, of that uh, bug report to help you understand uh, what things are actually happening at that time uh, of maybe a, a high power spike. So uh, next we have uh, performance monitoring or tracing and monitoring. Uh, Perfetto is a tool that Google provides uh, that does 
uh, recorded traces of uh, the device under test. Uh, it captures high frequency F trace data, uh, scheduling, task switching, CPU frequency, and honestly, so much more. There is just a wealth of information that uh, Profeto can capture, and it can actually be pretty overwhelming the first time you uh, start using it. So generally what I tell people is make sure that you have a, a well-defined issue that you're trying to understand find it in the in the timeline first and then start exploring the data from there uh, because you can very easily get lost in the amount of information that it provides. And then uh, in terms of uh, doing some monitoring, uh, a colleague of mine uh, at Square, uh, Pierre Eves, uh, wrote a uh, library called Leak Canary that you can uh, include in your Android apps uh, which will uh, detect uh, memory leaks uh, in the, the Java application or service. Uh, it has a built-in heap analyzer, uh, as well as it allows uh, for uploading uh, those heap analyses to third-party services. So what is a, a common problem with the existing tools and information? They're basically all great if you have the device right in front of you. Uh, it's If the device is in the field, you still need a way to get that information uh, back to yourself for analysis. And so this is an area where Memfault uh, can step in and help. Uh, kind of a, a quick overview is uh, this is your general um, release cycle, uh, if you say where you start at basically the, the design phase, you start writing your code, test, and then you do your release, your, uh, your actual deploy to a device, you then uh, observe it, analyze the data, and then provide feedback to your uh, design and engineering teams. So our goal is that after you integrate one time the board SDK, uh, then the next uh, release cycle, you'll get a lot of this uh, information uh, back to your, your engineers for uh, basically improving the stability of your devices. Uh, we focus on the, the right-hand side of uh, this cycle. so doing the release process, uh, doing actual OTI updates, and then uh, device and fleet monitoring, uh, as well as analysis of that, that data. Just want to give a, a quick overview of uh, the uh, Memfault uh, SDK for Android. Uh, the heart of it is the uh, Memfault Bort app. Uh, it connects and communicates with the Memfault update agent for facilitating and scheduling uh, OTA updates, which can be either full updates or uh, differential updates. Uh, and then it also connects to the Memfault usage reporter app, which collects uh, all of the different types of log files and crashes that we talked about earlier. Uh, it also has the capability of triggering uh, bug reports if if needed, um, but again, it, as I said before, it's not something that you want to be doing on a reg regular basis. And then uh, in a moment, we're going to go through a live demo where we uh, take a look at the uh, fleet dashboard, uh, individual devices, and then some of the issue tracking. make that a little bit bigger for you all. Uh, so from here, you can see uh, the number of active devices uh, over time. Uh, this is useful to understand uh, if devices are actually communicating uh, with the internet. Uh, I find this really useful that uh, it's coming to our, uh, our backend uh, versus your own, so that if you do have an issue with your own services that you're running, you have a second uh, reference point to understand how many devices are actually online. 
So you can see, okay, well, memfault says there's uh, 28 devices currently active, but I only see 15 check in on a daily basis. You can start asking like your server team to understand why that's happening. Uh, you also get a chart of uh, the rate at which software is being picked up over time uh, between different versions. So you can make sure that uh, your actual release is uh, being adopted by your users. Uh, if you have automatic uh, updates set up on your device, uh, it's this is helpful in understanding uh, that that process is working correctly. Uh, if it's something that needs to be manually triggered by a user, then uh, this is this can uh, help your team find ways to incentivize your users to update more quickly. And then we have a, an overall uh, breakdown of uh, different uh, versions in the field. Uh, super helpful if you have maybe a endpoint on the server side uh, that you want to deprecate and you want to know how many uh, users it would actually affect if you were to to take down that endpoint or something along those lines. We also uh, track the number of traces uh, each day that are coming in uh, and what those uh, top issues are. Traces can be really any sort of, I, I call them negative events. Uh, they're generally some sort of crash, uh, whether it's an, uh, a Java exception, a native exception, uh, a uh, kernel panic, WTF, anything along those lines. And then you can see the, the actual uh, top five issues uh, that are affect, affecting your devices in the field right now. Uh, next, we track all the different types of uh, reboots. Uh, so you can differentiate between a reboot caused by an OTA versus uh, a user initiated reboot or uh, something from, uh, let's say, a kernel panic where the device was forced to reboot. I really like having uh, the number of user-initiated uh, reboots here because uh, sometimes your devices can get in a state where they're not necessarily crashing, but they may still be misbehaving and they may not be actually creating any type of uh, trace event that would be easy to track. But if you see a high spike in the number of user in, uh, user initiated reboots, that can be um, a signal that something is going wrong with your device. And then finally, uh, we have uh, the newest issues on uh, a specific device. So if you're doing a rollout, you can see if you uh, just recently introduced something new to your uh, devices in the field. Uh, next here, I wanted to kind of show some of the, the metrics collection. Uh, metrics can be any sort of data uh, that is important to your organization. Um, it can, we have a lot of things that are already instrumented out of the box. And one of the, the powerful uh, abilities of this system is the uh, ability to compare different versions over time. So if we set up something uh, like this, where we can see the battery discharge rate was at a pretty nominal state uh, and low, but then we released version 1.1 and we see that there's a huge spike here. So our engineers went hard at work to figure out what regressed and w what the cause of that was. and we're able to validate that their fix actually resolved the issue in the, in the next release. And then uh, finally, if we go into an actual uh, device view, we'll go into this one right here. We can get very high detailed information about the devices. Uh, you can see when it was first seen uh, by Memfault, uh, as well as the last scene. So you can see, you know how quickly it's checking in, um, what uh, cohort it's in. So you can group devices into alpha, beta, production cohorts, or 
whatever is meaningful to your orga organization. You can also just add custom notes about it as well. If, uh, if this is like a device that's maybe in your development lab, you can annotate that. And then when we come down here, we start getting into uh, the timeline view. Uh, this is an example of a lot of the uh, battery met metrics that we've instrumented at this point. So you can see uh, trends in the data where uh, a device was plugged in and uh, the battery started to charge again. You can see what was uh, running on the device, whether it was uh, dozing, uh, if GPS was on, how strong that signal was, uh, how many actual uh, jobs were running on it, screen brightness, everything that you want to know. And so if you find an area of interest, you can uh, zoom into the, the data more clearly to understand uh, what was going on. When we, nope, oh, we don't have traces here. I'll go to another device in a second and show that. Uh, within the attributes, this is data that doesn't change all that often generally. They're usually um, things about your device that uh, you want to know on a, on a high level. Uh, it's not something like, you don't want to log like what the current battery level is, for instance. That's not important to understand as an attribute of the device. Uh, but you may want to log like what color the device is or uh, what uh, locale it's, it's locked to. Um, we also support linking multiple devices. So as I was saying with uh, Square, when we had a uh, product that was actually two different devices, uh, you can jump between them uh, via this uh, links uh, attribute here. And when you do that, you can actually look at the timelines in parallel and see what's happening on both devices at the same time. Uh, we collect all of the different uh, log files for you. Uh, you can do either continuous logging, depending on if you have uh, something that is, has a strong, uh, reliable network connection. Um, or you can have it only grab logs periodically. Um, for instance, like right before all the logs leading up to a crash uh, of the system. And then again, we, ha we uh, log each of the reboots here so you can see when they actually happened and you can jump to them uh, in the actual timeline view. Let's... Gonna jump into, this is actually for our MCU devices, uh, this project. Uh, so we do actually support uh, Linux, MCU, and Android. Uh, but I wanted to do a quick overview of the traces. So if we look at a specific trace event, uh, you get all of the uh, threads associated with it uh, and log messages that were logged uh, to the device. Uh, so if you want to learn anything more um, about AOSP tools and memfaults, uh, we have a, a couple different uh, webinars available. Uh, and I also wanted to mention the AOSP and uh, AOS meetup group. Uh, it's led by Chris uh, Simons. Uh, he's actually right there in uh, the middle of the, the crowd. Uh, it's very remote friendly and uh, it's talking about uh, all things AOSP and AOS. And thank you. And I'll leave this slide up again if anyone still needed to grab that. Do we have any questions? So how, how would you handle the, if you, 
you, you can only use Memfold if you have the ability to update it on the device itself, right? But what about just tracking the app, um, app crashes themselves? So if you don't have the ability on the, for the device itself? So you're talking about more so uh, tracking just application level crashes? Yeah. So honestly, if you're uh, looking at only application level crashes, uh, I would look at one of the other services such as like Bugsnag or Crashlytics. Mm. Um, they're geared more towards uh, one app's uh, specific crashes and understanding what's happening there. Whereas our goal is really to instrument the entire system and see it as a whole. So uh, honestly, like their services are very good at uh, tracking a specific app. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, one technical question. Um, so Manford is living in, as a system privileged app or how is it implemented in the um, AOSP tree then or in the device? Yeah, so uh, if I go back here. Uh, yeah. Um, so the it is a privileged app uh, on the device. Uh, the Memfall uh, SDK you would add to your repo manifest uh, and pull it into probably the, the vendor Memfall uh, part of the tree. Uh, from there, it's basically a, a simple uh, wiring up of Android make files to uh, pull in the uh, compiled apps. Um, from there, we set up all of the SE Linux policies uh, in our SDK. Uh, so really there's very little that you need to do. Uh, honestly, uh, the first time I implemented uh, the SDK, it took me about five minutes to wire up the actual uh, repo and config some uh, API keys and things like that. And then the build took 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> So the, the build took significantly longer than the amount of time it took me to actually wire everything up. So is this a persistent Correct, yes. Um, and then you can see here, uh, the memfault usage reporter, for instance, is a system app uh, on the device. But both the, the update agent and the board application are both uh, only privileged uh, services. And we're actually in the middle of uh, working on something that is uh, potentially even just installable on a generic uh, Android device that does not require uh, wiring up uh, into the actual Android build system. But we're still kind of working out some of the kinks with that. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, just to clarify then, this, this is not open source, but is there a free version that we can try out? Yeah, so the SDKs themselves are all open source, uh, but the backend uh, and the web services that you saw me demoing, are, you're correct, are not open source. Um, there is a, uh, a free trial version uh, that you can use for up to 10 devices. Uh, and I should have included a picture of that in my uh, slide deck. Um, but I can find that information for you and I'll add it to the, uh, the slide deck online after the fact. Thanks for the talk. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the update service and how does that work? It seems to be like a parallel thing to what you demonstrated, right? It, uh, yeah, it's... It's parallel, but it, we consider it part of our core offering uh, because we really want to enable uh, the whole right-hand side of this uh, graphic here. Uh, and we want to be able to understand the differences between two versions. Um, so here, uh, the memfault uh, board application does communicate with the update agent. Uh, 
to basically identify uh, what cohort uh, a device is in, send that information up to the server, uh, and then uh, the server determines which specific payload to provide it. Uh, so this can be uh, useful if you have alpha, beta, uh, and production groups. Uh, a device may be part of the alpha group, and therefore it gets bleeding edge software. Um, another option is if you have cohorts that are set up maybe by specific feature sets that a device has. Uh, you can uh, distribute different uh, software depending on that device. Um, so we use the uh, native uh, Android uh, uh, update engine on uh, in AOSP and provide it the uh, basically the, the tarball of uh, images that would be flashed to each of the AB partitions. So the update engine or the update agent, excuse me, is really focused on the uh, grouping of devices, understanding uh, what actual software should be installed to it, uh, and giving feedback on the state of the update. Any last questions? Well, thank you. <laughs>